so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end forever you and I will be in heaven or hell period In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen, Amen. Well I'm delighted to uh, be with you I have been with the Blue Army before more than once but I think only on the East Coast, as I remember. The last time, I think, was in Connecticut. Uh, but it's always a delight, I think, very highly of the Blue Army and the great work that you've done. And I'm going to talk this weekend. I'm, going to, I'm doing a new series uh, with you this weekend. Um, we're recording it, filming it. Uh, and it's on Fatima today message of life for a dying world. And during the course of uh, six sermons, which I'll give to you, uh, as our announcer said this evening, I'm going to speak first about the angels, uh, messengers, and the message. Um, those of you who are familiar with Fatima know how important uh, the angels were in the um, revelations at Fatima. And of course, the angels are important in everyday life. They're part of the doctrine of the faith. Uh, second, the second talk this evening, I'll give on the rosary and the brown scapula. And you know how important that is with respect to Fatima and in general. Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about reality in the third sermon. Reality, kind of like the news channels do, reality check. <laughs> reality. Very important. You know what reality is, absolutely speaking? God. Uh, God said, I am who am. Absolute, pure reality is God. Do you know what a good working definition of insanity is? To be out of touch with reality. That goes a long way to explaining what's going on in the world, doesn't it? If you're out of touch with God, you're out of touch with reality. You're really insane. <laughs> really. And I mean it literally. Uh, and that describes what's going on. We, we have an insane situation in the world. It's crazy. So I'll talk about reality. God, the reality of sin, grace, heaven and hell. Basic stuff. Like I said from the beginning, when the uh, director of my doctoral thesis in Spain, when I finished it and was about to receive my doctorate, he said, you, you've now earned five university degrees, and uh, we don't have any more to give you, so I assume you're finished. <laughs> At what level will you teach? And he was expecting me to say, well, I'll teach in the seminary, uh, in the university, uh, but I didn't have to think about it at all. It, it, he said, at what level you, will you teach? And I said, kindergarten. <laughs> and I've been doing it ever since. Kindergarten. You know, most Catholics really never advance be, beyond the basics. And that's okay. If you get the basics, that's good enough. That, that's all you need is the basics. But you've got to get the basics. Ninety-eight percent of us haven't even gotten the basics. That's what's wrong with the church, and that's what's wrong with the world. And so we have to work on improving that. Penance. We'll talk uh, on, on the angel's message. Penance, penance, penance. Message of, for the world today. Message of the cross. Very important. I'll talk in the fifth sermon on the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, a very real thing, something that is coming, uh, and you won't have to wait many centuries for it, I don't believe. And then in the final talk, which basically is um, the continuation 
and conclusion of that talk on the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I'll talk about the Eucharist, life for a dying world. The Eucharist, the source, center, and summit of the Church's life. The Eucharist, the greatest gift a loving God ever gave to his beloved children. The Holy Eucharist is the, the great treasure entrusted to the Church. And I'll, I'll give you a little hint, a little preview. Tomorrow afternoon, when I do that last talk on the Holy Eucharist, I'm going to have something very serious to say to Catholics at large. And before it's over, millions will have heard the message. Uh, you're, you're, going to, uh, you're going to be here with me doing this series, and we're going to be making a serious statement. We've got an election year this year in the most powerful, influential nation on the face of the earth. Now, I'll tell you ahead of time, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. That's your business. You know, I, I can't tell you who to vote for. That's, that's none of my business. That's between you and God in the uh, voting booth, you know. And, and so I'm not going to say anything about that. You know, I'm not, not going to tell you to vote Republican or Democrat. I'm not going to say any of that. But what I am going to say, and I am going to say it in my own way, <laughs> in no uncertain terms, I'm going to tell I'm going to give you principles. I'm going to tell you things that will help you. You've got to form your conscience. And then you've got to vote your conscience. And you know, we're Catholics and we're Christians. That means we've got to have a Catholic and Christian conscience formed to the objective norm of truth. You have a serious moral obligation to form that conscience and then to vote that conscience. We are poised on the edge of cataclysmic times. We have reached a decisive juncture in history. We can make history for better or for worse. And so in that last talk tomorrow, I'm just giving you a little hint, a little preview. I'm going to have plenty to say to Catholics, whether they be average Catholics, politicians, or bishops. I'm going to have something to say. I'll have my say. And before it's over, millions of people will hear it. That's why I have a frightening responsibility. I'm afraid to shut my mouth. <laughs> okay. Let's launch out into the deep, then, with the angels. The angels. We know that at Fatima, uh, the angels were a very important part of uh, the messages at Fatima, the way that God and Our Lady uh, spoke to the children. Uh, the, word the word angel means messenger. You know that. Um, very interesting uh, that the word angel doesn't describe what they are. Uh, it describes what they do. What they are is pure spiritual essences, right? Non-bodily beings. They have an intellect and a will. They're creatures. Now, a but, by the way, now I know I don't have to tell you this. Um, you and I are friends. Uh, I, I don't have to say a whole lot to you folks. This is a rather uh, easy audience for me to speak to because I know that I know where most of you are coming from, if not all of you. Uh, I know that you believe in the existence and activity of the holy angels, but there are people who don't. Now, that doesn't bother me, but there are some Catholics who don't. Uh, I, I remember one of the, f I think it was the first uh, to a large, I've told this story a million times, but I'll tell it one more time. They didn't know who I was. They didn't know what they were getting, but they had heard that I was available and somebody got sick, so I filled in. 
And the keynote speaker gave a talk, and I heard it. I was right there. He was a rather well-known theologian and uh, of the liberal variety. <laughs> and he said, uh, it went kind of like this. Well, uh, you know, we don't really believe in angels anymore. That's how he started his talk. Uh, we don't really believe in the actual existence of angels. No, you see, angels are what we call a literary device. Something that's used in sacred scripture to illustrate a point, to make some theological point. And at that point, by the way, there was an elderly woman in the front row, as there always is, somewhere or other. <laughs> And they are my best friends, I want to tell you. Uh, and, uh, you know, when he said, we don't really believe in angels anymore, uh, they're just literary devices, the old gal turned to her friend and whispered, I wish one of them there literary devices would come down and kick his butt. <laughs> well, <clears throat> he went on. And we don't really believe in purgatory because God could never allow suffering of any kind. And we certainly don't believe in hell because a good and loving God could never have a hell. Well, finally he finished. And wouldn't you know it, he went and sat right next to the old girl. <laughs> now, she had reached that age where she really didn't care. You know? Now, I, I watched this all unfold. <laughs> she tried. She really tried to be on her best behavior. She, you could tell she was struggling with it. But finally, she leaned over and whispered in his ear, Father, you don't believe in hell. And he said, oh, no, my dear. He said, well, you'll believe it when you get there. <laughs> And that rather illustrates the point. <laughs> Listen, the existence and activity of the holy angels is a part of the doctrine of the faith. That's not optional teaching. That's not medieval theology. That's not an old wives' tale. That's rock-solid doctrine. There are angels, and they are active in the work of salvation. Let me read to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's a section on the angels in the profession of faith, in the first section. Paragraph 328. The existence of the spiritual, non-corporeal beings that sacred scripture usually calls angels is a truth of faith. The witness of scripture is as clear as the unanimity of tradition. So, I know that I don't have to convince you, but let's start there. It's an absolute doctrine of the faith. You have to believe that. Anyone who professes to be Catholic or Christian who doesn't believe that doesn't believe what the church believes. No question about it. There are angels. All right. What do they do? Well, they're messengers. That's what the word means, messengers. They carry messages from God to us. They convey things to us. Uh, and likewise, they bring things from us to God. You remember the image of Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament, of the angels ascending and descending as if on a ladder. Uh, they're... they're uh, they are the original information superhighway. The angels. Uh, they do other things, too. Uh, they protect us. There are guardian angels. Um, every human being... Now, this is also part of the doctrine of the faith. Every human being has a guardian angel assigned to him by God from the very beginning. Now... Never mind the TV program. 
uh, about the angels. That's very nice. It's kind of nice that they have a program that's kind of positive about angels. This is rock-solid doctrine. This is not just a story. This is absolute. We have a guardian angel, every one of us. Now, I, be I believe some of our guardian angels have to work harder than others. <laughs> My... <laughs> Mine will probably receive several medals before it's over. <laughs> Others might not have such a hard time, you know. Uh, but we've got one. Thank God uh, we've got uh, an angel, a pure spiritual essence. You know, they, they behold the face of God constantly. Uh, they're powerful. Don't mess with your angel. What do I mean by that? Well, from your earliest years, your angel transmits messages to you. Uh, don't do that. Do that. Messengers. The angels are involved in that. You know, good inspirations like you have. You know, like you, you may, uh, out of nowhere, have this good inspiration. You may see a poor person. You may see someone in trouble. And you'll have this inspiration to help them. Uh, undoubtedly, it came through the ministry of your guardian angel or another angel. Uh, there are all kinds of stories about the angels, and, and I believe true, many of them. Um, I remember one uh, blessed uh, Jose Maria Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei. <clears throat> During the uh, Spanish Revolution, when priests were very much in danger, uh, where they were being killed, he was walking up the steps of the cathedral, I forgot, maybe in Madrid, and uh, a man approached him rapidly, and he seemed to have a gun. And all of a sudden, at the last moment, a very large, powerful-looking man stepped between Jose Maria and the assailant and frightened him away. And then he came up to Jose Maria, and he whispered in his ear, Mangy donkey. Mangy donkey. And he knew immediately that it had to be his guardian angel, because no one knew about that term. You see, he always referred to himself as a mangy donkey in his prayers. And no one knew about that, not a soul. So he feels that his guardian angel had intervened to protect him from the assailant. I can't tell you how many times my guardian angel protected me throughout the course of my life. Uh, and, and I had a pretty wild life. Um, it's a pretty dangerous thing to roll a car at 150 miles an hour you'd agree. I did once in the glorious state of California on my way to Nevada. Going about 150, flipped it. Crawled out through a window. Didn't have a scratch on me. Not a scratch. Looked at the car and couldn't believe it. The highway patrol put it up for a demonstration. <laughs> uh, they, they, they put it up as, as an exhibit around Barstow, California. That's where it happened, out in the desert, you know, where you can go real fast if you're real stupid. <laughs> Not a scratch. I've been shot at. You name it. Guardian angel, always there, always there. And you've got one, too. Powerful. Remember the movie Star Wars? Remember the, uh, the little robots, you know, R2, D2, and uh, C, what is it, 3, CPO, whatever? Yeah. When, that, when I saw them, you know how they helped out, you know, the, the Jedi Knights? They helped fly the spaceship and everything. I, I couldn't help but think, man, that's the angels. That's the angels. 
that we don't have robots, man. We got angels, real angels, powerful. And God and Our Lady used the angels as messengers. At Fatima, they, they, the angel, remember uh, the angel of peace. He said, I am the angel of peace. And the angel of, of Portugal, when the angel first appeared, he said to the three children, fear not. Those words remind you of the words of Jesus. Um, fear is useless. I, and by the way, remember this. This will this will come in handy as time goes on, what Jesus said. Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. So the angel said, Fear not, I am the angel of peace. Pray with me. Kneeling on the ground, he bowed profoundly until he touched the ground with his forehead and told the children to repeat three times, My God, I believe, I hope, I adore and I love thee. I ask pardon for those who do not believe, who do not adore, who do not hope, and who do not love thee. That's the message the angel conveyed to the little children. You see, and now, th and you know when th this was a long time ago, you know, almost a hundred years ago. And what did the angel say? Well, he, he gave them a prayer, and that prayer was to counteract something that was going on even back then in the world. I believe. Well, why did the angel instruct them to pray that way? I believe for the lack of faith in the world. And how much worse is it today? And we say, I believe. And much of the world says, I do not believe. And we say, I adore. And much of the world says, I refuse to adore. And we, we say, we hope. And the world is losing hope. Do you know what hope is? This is very important. I like to key in on this. Hope. Hope is the theological virtue by which we desire heaven and eternal life. Trusting in the promises of Christ and relying not on ourselves, but on the gift of the grace of the Holy Spirit. That's the church's definition of the theological virtue of hope. The key part, hope is a desire. People desire all kinds of things. And if you desire anything less than God, you'll be frustrated. Uh, St. Augustine said it best. Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in Thee. Our mind... Our intellect is meant for God, truth. And our mind can't rest until it rests in the truth. And our will, our heart, is made for God. It's, it's made for the good. It's made for love. And it can't rest until it rests in that goodness who is God himself. What is hope? Hope is the desire for heaven and eternal life. If you, absolutely speaking, spend all your time desiring something less than God, meaning something created, you're setting yourself up for frustration, sadness, disappointment. God alone suffices. Nothing less than God suffices. I didn't know that a good part of my life. You know, so I chased created things. We, we think that that'll make us happy, you know? And, and that's the message, message, that's the message the world gives us. Remember, you know what the devil, the demons are? They're also angels, you know, fallen angels. They're also messengers, but not the same message, a very different message. What do they tell you? Try it, you'll like it. Right? I mean, really, you know? If only you could have that much money. 
If only you could have that house. If only you could have that car, that job, that man, that woman. Then you'd be happy. Wrong. Wrong. And so we chase one created good after the next, engaged in a chronic, perpetual exercise in futility and frustration. And then we wonder why we have no peace, why we have no joy. Let me tell you, take it from somebody who's been there and done that. No amount of money is going to make you happy. Now, I know that a few more bucks might not hurt. <laughs> and I don't begrudge you that. Now, I know. We've got to have some money. That's just the way the world works. And that's okay. And it's okay to work for some money. Not a problem. Keep your priorities straight. Don't engage in idolatry. You know, you, you can er erect all kind of created things as idols. Money is, is probably the, the number one idol that's been uh, erected in society today. And, and believe me, people fall down and worship it. They do. They say, oh, no, I wouldn't worship money. Then why you spend all your time chasing it? That's what happens, you know. Uh, sex, drugs. Rock and roll can be idols, you know. Uh, be careful. Be careful what you worship. You know, uh, people say, oh, I don't worship that. What do you spend all your time doing? You know, I often ask people, just to illustrate a point, how, how, how much time you watch television in a given day. And I'm not saying that watching television is evil. I'm not saying that. But, but just to make you think, uh, they say that the average person in the United States watches four or five hours of television a day. And so I just say, well, how many hours a day you devote to God? How many hours a day you pray? And then just compare it to how many hours you watch television, just, just to give you an idea of where your priorities are. You know, and watch out for what you erect as an idol. And so the angels delivered this, this message, this prayer. You know, most of the world doesn't believe, doesn't hope, doesn't adore, and doesn't love God with their whole heart, mind, and strength. And so the angel was conveying this message, this prayer, and trying to get the children in their purity, in their innocence, to pray. Why? To offer reparation for the world which didn't feel that kind of faith and hope uh, and love. And the message isn't just for the little children at Fatima. It's for you and for me, you know? You've got to have faith. What's faith? The th faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God Believe all that God has said and revealed to us. Believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief. Because he who has revealed it is truth itself. That's a theological virtue of faith. That's real faith. Yeah, we believe in God. doesn't just mean that we believe in the existence of God. You know, some people today think they're doing God a favor by believing in his existence. They do. Uh, you know, if I say, what is faith? Oh, I believe in God. What, what does that mean exactly? Well, you know, he's exist, he exists. Listen, Satan believes in the existence of God, and you know where he is. <laughs> Not enough. If you really believe in God, then you believe everything he's said. Everything is revealed to us. And you believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief. You know, it, it, you're not a cafeteria Catholic. You don't just pick and choose, accept what fits with your lifestyle, reject what you don't like. You can't do it. It comes as a package, an integrity. You've got to accept it all, or you run the risk of losing it all. Like St. Thomas Aquinas says, uh, the faith is a seamless garment. Uh, you can't 
uh, excise a piece of it here, tear a piece of it there. It just doesn't work that way. It's just like if you have a, uh, a, a ship on the ocean. Well, you, 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 you blast one hole in the hull of the ship, the whole ship goes to the bottom. Or you have a, a stone wall and you take a stone out at the foundation, the entire wall collapses. That's what happens with the faith. It's an integrity. Uh, once you start rejecting elements of faith or morals, you run the, you're down a slippery slope. And then it's one after the other. They fall by the wayside. The message in all this. Pray like this, the angel said to the children and says to us. Pray like this. Think like this. Live like this. My God, I believe. I believe for all the people who don't believe. I hope for all the people who no longer hope. God help us. I've seen some of the dark places in the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen some of the darkest places on the face of the earth. And when I say that, I mean, I saw a lot of dark places in the days when I lived in Los Angeles. In the days when I was dancing with the devil. In the days when I was addicted to cocaine. I've been in dark places. I've been in those moral caves and holes in the ground. A miracle that I'm alive. Uh, all those people that have lost hope. Oh, I, I wake up in the middle of the night often sweating, frightened. And those people, I can see them. I can see them. Oh, I see him getting high in that crack house. I see him on the way to death. I fear for them. And I pray, I hope. I'll hope for them. They've lost hope, so many of them. My Lord, my God, I hope for all the ones who can no longer hope. You've got to think that way. You've got to live that way. Pray that way. There's a message not just for the little children, the seers at Fatima, but for us. Today, now, here. Message of life. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. Pray like this. For the hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to your prayers, the angel told the children. And then the angel appeared to them again in midsummer and said, What are you doing? You know, he was kind of upbraiding them. They were not, they were spending a lot of their time like most children would do. Uh, not, not like their life depended on these prayers. Not like somebody else's soul depended on this. What are you doing, the angel said, the messenger from God said. What are you doing? Might be saying the same thing to us. What are you doing? Pray. Pray and pray some more. For the hearts of Jesus and Mary have merciful designs on you. Offer constantly to the Almighty prayers and sacrifices. Now, every book, every uh, sermon, every series of sermons like this series that I'm doing this weekend, it kind of has a punchline. You should be able to synthesize it, condense it, Reduce it to its lowest common denominator. And, and, and the message of Fatima, really, is a message of prayer and penance. It can be reduced to this. You know, if you know all about what went on at Fatima, the miracle of the sun and all that, and it doesn't move you in some way to live the message, then you're wasting your time. All the energy that people expended thinking about, you know, the third, the third secret of Fatima. That's a waste of time unless it moves you to live the message of Fatima. Pray and do penance. Okay, that's the punchline. That's it. Right there. 
offer constantly to God your prayers and sacrifices. Now, that's always been true throughout the ages. Almost a hundred years ago, the angel, the messenger, revealed that to the children. Pray and do penance constantly. Now, you and I know, more or less, what's transpired in the world in this past hundred years or so. Do you think that message is more or less relevant today? Yeah, more. It's got to be. Look at the state of the world. You know, that it's, oh, yes, we can say, well, Russia's been converted. That's not the real message. That's not the real message. The real message has to do with the bottom line, and that's the salvation of souls. That's the bottom line. And, and what are we doing about it? Why did Jesus came? come? Jesus came to set the captives free, right? Jesus came to effect redemption. Jesus was born to die on a cross. We are born, and we will die. And what is the meaning of our life? Any different from the good Lord? Can't be. The servant can be no different than his master. And Jesus said, where I am, there my servant will be. There he is, lifted up on a cross. And what about you and me? Is there a cross in our destiny? You better believe it. Pray and do penance. Now, if you all go to sleep right now, or go home and don't come back tomorrow, if you remember that one thing and put it into practice, you will have gotten it. Pray and do penance constantly between now and the moment you die. And that will be the most powerful thing you can do for the church, for the United States, for the whole world. It's about souls. It's about the salvation of souls. Of everything you possibly can, the angel said, Offer a sacrifice to atone for the sins that offend God and to implore grace for the conversion of sinners. In this way, you will obtain peace for your country. Now, please listen to the Every word is important. Listen to it. Now, the angel, the messenger, is speaking to the children. Of everything you possibly can, Offer a sacrifice to atone for sins that offend God and to implore for the, the conversion of sinners. And in this way, you'll obtain peace for your country. In this way, you'll obtain peace for your country. And in no other way will you obtain peace for your country. Pray and do penance for the conversion of sinners. In this way, you will bring peace to your country. In no other way will you bring peace to your country. Above all, accept and humbly endure the sufferings the Lord sends you. The angel speaking to the children. The angel speaking to us. Above all, accept and humbly endure the sufferings the Lord sends you. They may be little sufferings. They may be minor inconveniences. Be humble and accept them. My grandmother, in the good old days, uh, had a very, uh, as many, uh, you, you've all experienced it probably growing up. My grandmother used to say when I would do something, have to do something I didn't like, like go to school, <laughs> which I did not like when I was young. She said, Johnny, offer it up. Remember that, offer it up. And what she was doing is, is in those simple words, she was expressing what the angel's saying here. She was expressing a very 
basic element of our faith. Oh, offer it up. Grandma, I, I, don't, I don't like this food. Eat it and offer it up. Uh, but I don't want to, you know, uh, take out the garbage in three feet of snow. Offer it up. But I don't want to walk to school this morning in the snow, a mile, through a blizzard. I'm old school. <laughs> offer it up. Offer it up. That's what she'd say, offer it up. And what she would say, hey, a little penance won't hurt you, you know? A little sacrifice won't hurt you. Uh, it's going to happen anyway. You might as well make use of it. You know, you can complain and moan and groan about it, or you can unite it to Jesus on the cross, and it can be powerful. Bring down grace. That was a, that was a wise thing for Grandma to say to me. It was obviously wisdom that the angel imparted to the children, and nothing's changed. Now, this is a basic message. Fatima isn't rocket science. In case you, anybody hadn't figured that out yet. It's totally elemental faith. Pray and do penance. Now, if you're looking for something more profound than that, looking for something other, forget it. That's what it is. You know, people, as St. Teresa used to say, oh, they break their head trying to come up with all kind of things, this and that and other things, because maybe that basic, simple little message doesn't suit them. Uh, maybe they don't want to bother themselves with praying and doing penance, so they're looking for some other little pious exercise they can do. Forget it. Pray and do penance. That's the only way. The angel said, of everything you possibly can offer sacrifice. Now, people have funny ideas about what penance is. Uh, we read a few lives of the saints, and we get a preconceived notion about penance. You know, I did that when I began. I, read, I systematically read 500 Lives of the Saints when I came back to the church after 20 years. Uh, I didn't never do nothing halfway. <laughs> 500 of them, folks. I read, every, I read it cover to cover. And, you know, I had some idea about what the saints did. But you've got to be careful about taking a lot of that literally. You've got to learn the principles and then apply that to your life as it is to be lived today. Uh, an example, okay? Now, you read a lot of the saints, they, they did these rigorous penances, like they wore hair shirts, right? You, you, the saint, he'd wear a hair shirt. Now, what's a hair shirt? Uh, we don't have that really today, but a hair shirt, that would be a, a shirt made out of horse hair, usually, very coarse hair. It's scratchy, you know? It's like wearing a coarse wool coat next to your skin, kind of itchy, scratchy, not comfortable. You, would, you certainly wouldn't do it on a July day in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, but they might do that for penance, right? They used to do those kind of things. Um, but, but I always tell people, you don't need to wear a hair shirt today. You don't need to. Why? Uh, because your hair shirt might be sitting next to you. Uh, you might be married to your hair shirt. And so don't, don't be looking around for all kind of weird penances to do. You know, you don't have to look around for all kind of exotic penances to do. You know, sleeping on a bed of nails or something. Man, live in peace in your own house, how about? That can be an extreme form of penance for a lot of us, right? I mean, religious know this. Uh, nuns and monks, they got to live in a community. <clears throat> it is a blessing. It's a blessing from God, but any one of them, it, you know, it, it, they'll tell you, they say, don't think it's easy, day in and day out, and it's not. You know, to live with another human being, a group of human beings, day in and day out, and to be charitable under all circumstances, to be patient and so forth, that's not easy, but it's good. It requires the exercise of virtue. And so the angel said, of everything you possibly can, offer a sacrifice. Now, he's telling them, really, he's giving them a clue on how to do penance. It's one thing to tell somebody, uh, pray and do penance. But a lot of people don't know how to do penance, especially nowadays, you know? 
The church tells us, Pope Paul VI, uh, after the Second Vatican Council, uh, he wrote a document on penance in the church called Penitimony. And one of the key phrases in there is the primary form of penance is to accept with joy and gratitude the trials and tribulations that your state in life bring to you. In other words, if you're married, uh, there are trials and tribulations that go along with being married. It's not easy, in other words. Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe dad is a little rough around the edges. You know, maybe he doesn't go to church as much as you do. Maybe that, well, it's a challenge to live under those circumstances. So, well, hey, offer it up. I mean, do the best you can. If you can convert the old boy, good. You know, but it might take a long time. might be on his deathbed or yours. But, you know, hang in there. Hang in there. That's a form of penance. I remember once when I, first, I, I came to San Francisco several years ago, I was invited to give the annual retreat to all the novices of the Missionaries of Charity in San Francisco. And uh, at the time, the novice mistress was uh, Sister Lisa, and, uh, who's now third counselor. Uh, to Sister Nirmala in, uh, in Calcutta. And um, Sister told me how Mother first came when they got that convent in uh, San Francisco. Um, it was kind of in bad shape, but they fixed it up and they cleaned it up and Mother came finally. And uh, it was like inspection day. Now, a lot, you, you may not know it, you know, Mother Teresa, I was a saint, um, but she was like an army general. A lot of people don't know a lot of things about Mother Teresa, and, uh, but she was tough, and uh, she came for inspection, see. And Sister, Nirm or rather Sister Lisa was taking Mother on a tour of the convent. And they got down in the basement um, where the bathrooms were. And it was like, they're like public restrooms, you know. And uh, they walked in, and it was sparkling clean. I mean, it, the floor, the tile was shining. And in the 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 store the stalls to the toilets, you know, they were all open for inspection, right? And mother went in there and she just stopped and she looked and she just broke it out into the biggest grin and she just sat there beaming in the bathroom. And the sister said, Mother, what on earth are you so delighted about sitting standing there smiling? She said, Look. Look, sister, look how those toilets shine. Some sister loves Jesus very much. <laughs> she was dead serious. What did she mean by that? Of everything you possibly can, offer it as a sacrifice to God. Listen, everything has that potential. Everything. You know, you're, you're, you're cleaning the house, the baby's diapers, whatever. You know, you got a job, uh, you know, at work that you don't particularly like. Offer it up. <laughs> of everything you possibly can, offer it as a sacrifice. Now that, cultivate that attitude. Cultivate that state of soul. That's powerful. That brings down grace. Not only on you and your family, but the whole world. You see, one of the worst things that's happened, one, one of the greatest victories of the devil is to get us to stop doing penance. To, to get us to lose that spirit of sacrifice. Now that spirit of sacrifice, by the way, uh, that the Catholics had in general more years ago. Like when my grandmother and my, when my mother was a child, uh, they had that spirit of sacrifice. That was ingrained in them. The priests and the nuns, they taught the people, offer it up. And what they meant was, look, if it's, if it's not pleasing, if it's unpleasant, if it's difficult, if it's painful, offer it up. You know, uh, whether it's your job or cancer, offer it up. Unite it to Jesus crucified. And there's power in it. That's what the angel said to the children. And that's what he says to us. Of everything you possibly can, offer it as a sacrifice 
That's pleasing to God. You're united to Jesus and him crucified. That's, a, that's the, one of the, 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 my favorite line from my doctoral thesis, and I don't remember offhand most of it, of course, but one thing, and I know the Holy Spirit gave it to me, one line from it is, to be set on the cross in Christ is to be placed at the pinnacle of human possibilities. You think about that. To be elevated on the cross in Christ is to be set at the very pinnacle of human possibilities. Why? Because no greater love hath a man but that he lay down his life for his friends. Of everything you possibly can, offer it as a sacrifice to God. That's what the messenger said. O blessed Trinity, the angel said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore thee reverently and offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, to atone for the insults, profanities, and indifferences which offend him, and for the infinite merits of his sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary, I implore the conversion of poor sinners. It's the Eucharist again. Offer the Holy Eucharist to the Father. Offer Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity to the Father. That's the most pleasing sacrifice that there is, the sacrifice of the Son, the Paschal Mystery, the Passion Death, the Resurrection of the Lord. When we, when we go to Mass, when we receive Holy Communion, think, remember what it is. I'll talk much more about it tomorrow in that last talk. This is not something trivial. The Holy Eucharist is not merely a sign of Jesus. It is Jesus. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. Emmanuel, God among us. Jesus, true God and true man. That's the Eucharist. And God is continually outraged by the sacrileges that have been compounded with each advancing year. People in mortal sin, cavalierly, cavalierly walking up and receiving the Holy Eucharist as though it were nothing. Politicians who call themselves Catholic and vote for an ungodly, heinous catastrophe and outrage called abortion, partial birth abortion. And then they receive the Holy Eucharist, having been collaborators in the most outrageous sin imaginable. Unbelievable. Outrage. Atone. Offer reparation. Say the prayer. O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you reverently, and I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. My dear friends, the Eucharist is the hope of the world, the only hope of the world. And when enough of us become serious, about making the Holy Eucharist truly the center of our life. When we become more and more holy and reverent and well disposed so that we can offer reparation for those unbelievable sacrileges which are so common. An example, a proof, if you will. On Sundays, Everybody goes to Holy Communion. Check out the confession line on Saturday. Very few people. Very few people. And so shall we believe that we no longer sin. 
we're all immaculately conceived. <laughs> or perhaps are a lot of people receiving the Blessed Eucharist with a soul that's less than clean. I think a lot of us have to go to confession more frequently. I know you do, but, but in the church in general, it's a big problem, a terribly big problem message is almost a hundred years old. It is as fresh and relevant as it happened yesterday. And so, listen. Listen to the messenger who spoke to the children, who said, eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, terribly outraged by the ingratitude of men, and then offer reparation for their sins and console God. Now there is a thought that should console us. We can console God. We can console God. Pray, do penance, work with Jesus for the salvation of souls.